Black Dahlia Episode 17 The Werewolf Murders End Was there a police cover-up? Part 1 Many Black Dahlia theorists suggest there was a police cover-up of the murder. In fact, the 1949 grand jury was getting ready to investigate not just the Black Dahlia murder, but also the murders of several other women that had gone unsolved for years before and after the murder of Beth Short. Grand Jury Foreman Harry Lawson said this. There is every possibility that we will summon before the jury officers involved in the investigation of these murders. We find it odd that there are on the books of the Los Angeles Police Department many unsolved crimes of this type. Because of the nature of these murder and sex crimes, women and children are constantly placed in jeopardy and are not safe from attack. Something is radically wrong with the present system for apprehending the guilty. The alarming increase in the number of unsolved murders and other major crimes reflects ineffectiveness in law enforcement agencies and the courts, and that should not be tolerated. But unsolved murders were not the only things on the agenda. The grand jury also looked into the Brenda Allen prostitution ring, abortionist rings, the Leslie Dillon fiasco, and payoffs to police. Even police chief Clemens Horrell and assistant chief Joe Reed would come under fire, in fact, they and three other officers would be indicted for perjury. They were eventually acquitted, but Horrell and Reed resigned, leading to temporary interim chief, retired Marine Corps General William A. Wharton's, which would lead to a showdown between Thad Brown and William H. Parker vying to replace him. Brown seemed sure to win with three commissioners supporting him and two supporting Parker, but after the death of Brown supporter Mrs. Curtis Albro, Parker would begin his 16-year term as police chief until his death in 1966. Then, Brown would finally get his chance to be chief, although in an interim capacity until he was replaced by Thomas Redden. Although it would be interesting to go into the long history of Los Angeles police and city government corruption all the way back to the birth of the city, that would take hours and would have nothing to do with the Black Dahlia. However, I think it would be beneficial to go back about a decade before Beth's murder to discuss just how corrupt the city's institutions were by focusing on the explosive end to Mayor Frank Shaw's reign in 1938. Shaw was elected mayor in 1933 and quickly appointed his brother, Joe, as his personal secretary, although Chief Fixer was closer to the truth. Joe Shaw quickly assumed control of the police and fire departments and started collecting bribes from both crooked cops and civilian criminals. Frank Shaw reappointed James, Two Gun, Davis as police chief. Davis had a unique view of law enforcement, Davis said. The gun-toting element and the rum smugglers are going to learn that murder and gun-toting are inimical to their best interests. I want them brought in dead, not alive, and will reprimand any officer who shows the least mercy to a criminal." Two-Gun Davis had previously been police chief from 1926 to 29, and served his second term from 1933 to 39. During both terms, he created special units that were under his complete control. In his first term he created what he called a gun squad consisting of 50 men to combat bootlegging, and in his second, he formed a red squad to keep an eye on labor movements and potential communist activity, even going so far as to have members working as security during strikes. His second term would also see members of the LAPD used as spies and enforcers for the rule of Mayor Shaw. Joe Shaw ran a jobs for bribes scheme as related in an article for the Los Angeles Herald Express on May 12, 1989 by John R. Babcock. The Shaw brothers themselves were quite innovative in corruption. It was no secret that if you wanted a job as a policeman, you went to the plaza and looked for the man with the white carnation. After making contact and negotiating a price, he'd give you the answers to the civil service examination. I have no doubt that police officers hired under such means would have been completely loyal to the Shaw regime. The Shaw years also saw a prostitution scandal similar to the Brenda Allen prostitution ring of the 40s. Only this Hollywood madam was known as the Black Widow, real name enforced, who started her operation in the last days of the John C. Porter administration and reached its height under the Shaw years. The five brothels she ran netted between $3,500 and $5,000 a week, 
and she had to pay a $50 weekly payoff to the vice squad for each house. Men involved in the prostitution ring were given complimentary police badges. One of the known vice cops who received bribes from prostitution and gambling rings owned a yacht and made frequent party excursions to Catalina Island. Forst also witnessed direct payoffs to police. The most damning statement she made against Shaw was, I was told to vote for Frank Shaw for mayor, because if he was elected the town would be wide open. Wide open. It was my understanding that the syndicate took care of all the police officers. The head of the squad got the first cut, and what was left was split up among the other members of the squad. It wasn't long into Mayor Shaw's tenure that concerned citizens formed Civic, the Citizens' Independent Vice Investigating Committee, under the leadership of Clifton's cafeteria's owner Clifford Clinton, who operated the cafeteria's under a policy that if patrons could not afford the full cost of the meal they could pay what they could, and would not be turned away even if they could pay nothing. A county supervisor, John Anson Ford, approached future Los Angeles Mayor Judge Fletcher Boron to appoint Clinton to a grand jury to investigate corruption allegations against the Shaws. They hoped that by placing an honest man on the grand jury they might see positive results in any investigations. They were only partly right. At least 17 of Los Angeles County's 50 superior court judges, responsible for choosing the 19 yearly members of the grand jury, were on the take and stacked the jury with members who supported the Shaw regime and its illegal interests. And Clifford Clinton soon found that being an honest man on the grand jury wasn't good for his business, and, as time would tell, could have proven hazardous to his health. Clinton and three honest jurors suggested a broader investigation to the illicit activities going on. The grand jury foreman refused. Clinton went directly to Mayor Shaw, who as yet was not suspected by Clinton of any wrongdoing, and using his credentials as civic creator, suggested he press police to open an investigation into the growing vice problem. At first, Shaw went along, viewing it as a way to garner public support, not to mention trying to divert negative attention and suspicion should he disagree. Although Chief Davis wasn't supportive of the idea, the Shaw regime went ahead with cooperating with the concerned citizens. Mayor Shaw quickly realized the scope of the civic investigation was broader and deeper than he had believed, especially after Civic released its report on L.A. corruption. Civic investigators found that 600 brothels, 300 illegal gambling casinos, 1,800 bookie operations, and 23,000 slot machines operating in the city. Even after release of the Civic report, the grand jury refused to open further investigation, and the Shaw regime ended all support. In frustration, Clinton discussed the matter with Judge Boron, who suggested Clinton and his grand jury allies make a minority grand jury report. However the presiding judge ruled that the report could not be released. Boron counter-ruled, and the report was released. As quoted from the book L.A. Noir The Struggle for the Soul of America's Most Seductive City by John Bunton. The report was scathing. It found that underworld profits were being used to finance the campaigns of city and county officials in vital positions. In exchange, Local officials were turning a blind eye to a vast network of brothels, clip joints, gambling houses, and bookmakers. The report charged that officials from all three of the principal law enforcement agencies in the county, the district attorney's office, the sheriff's department, and the LAPD, work in complete harmony and never interfere with the activities of important figures in the underworld. Instead of finding support, Clinton soon found himself under public attack from jury foreman, John Bauer, supported by the Shaw backing Los Angeles Times, which wrote negative statements about Clinton. After a notary testified that Foreman Bauer was in Shaw's pocket. Shaw and his corrupt city institutions soon grew sick of the crusading Clinton and others sticking their noses into things. Needless to say, Bauer wasn't happy with the revelations, but his payback showed just how far Shaw and his cronies would go to stay in power. Bauer showed up at the notary's house along with District Attorney Baron Fitz and a team of police thugs, who beat the hell out of the man, who would need hospitalization. They turned up the heat on Clinton too. His property taxes were increased by $7,000.
he was denied necessary business permits. Erroneous complaints of food poisoning flooded in, prompting harassment from city health inspectors. However, not everything went Shaw's way. A commissioner with the Water and Power Department was convicted on charges of running a protection racket. And Brother Joe Shaw and Police Lieutenant Pete Delgado were indicted for their job-selling scheme. Delgado flew the coop to Mexico, but Brother Joe was found guilty on 63 counts. Then, a police commissioner lawyer turned out to be the personal attorney for two known crime syndicate members. The city was now at war. The forces of Mayor Shaw, crooked cops in the Two-Gun Davis-led police department, Fitz and other cronies in the DA office, Shaw regime supporters in the Los Angeles Times, who always backed their candidate while smearing Clinton and his civic organization, and of course their criminal cohorts, who were filling their pockets like never before, unified against Civic and Clinton. But through all of the threats, intimidation, and schemes to put Clinton out of business, he and Civic would not back down. With unknown members of the police controlled by Shaw, and no one to turn to or trust in the department, Civic hired private investigator Harry Raymond, himself a former LAPD vice officer, to look into things. The more Raymond found, the deadlier the threats against Clinton, Civic, and Raymond became. First, a bomb exploded in Clinton's basement. He and his family were unhurt, but he was also undeterred, especially after police accused him of bombing his own house as a publicity scheme. Then, as Raymond raced to connect the dots in his investigation, Shaw's henchman decided the P.I. was getting too close. On January 14, 1938, Harry Raymond climbed into his car, cranked the engine, and spent the next several months in the hospital after the car blew up, recovering from as many as 186 shrapnel wounds. Mayor Shaw was conveniently out of town at the time, but upon his return he stated that the bombing might have been an accident. Chief Two-Gun Davis was conveniently in Mexico, but received a report from the head of his special intelligence unit, Captain Earl Kinnett, who told the chief that he thought the bomb had been planted by an underworld hitman. But after Raymond gave a hospital bed interview to Examiner City Editor Jimmy Richardson that pointed the finger at Kinnett. It turned out that Kinnett and a six-man team were staking out Raymond's house from a rental across the street. Raymond said, they told me they would get me. They put Kinnett on me. I've known for weeks he and his boys were shadowing me. They had my phone tapped. Somewhere in the neighborhood you'll find where they had their listening devices. Kinnett takes his orders from City Hall, and they wanted me out of the way. He's the one who rigged the bomb. Kinnett and other officials once again claimed that Raymond had planted the bomb as a publicity stunt. But the days for the Shaw regime were numbered. It came out that members of Two Gun Davis's intelligence squad had also been spying in Shaw's political rivals. Noting much happened to the intelligence squad members, who all pleaded the fifth at the grand jury, and all were returned to their jobs after a brief suspension. And with Shaw supporter Baron Fitz as district attorney, it seemed like the trial of Captain Kinnett and a subordinate, Lieutenant Roy G. Allen, would be nothing but a kangaroo court. Luckily, the mountain of collected evidence against Kinnett was too high for his pile of bullshit to overcome. His alibi of being home helping his wife medicate an infected eye with a boric acid compress didn't hide the bomb-making equipment, including detonating wire, found in Kinnett's garage. Then they found proof that Kinnett had bought the pipe used for the bomb. Then enters a unique witness for the prosecution who tied up everything and explained to the jurors how the bomb was made. Jack Parsons was a fascinating character, a genius rocket scientist by day who specialized in making rocket fuels that were ahead of the times, and an occultist by night who followed the Thelema religion created by Aleister Crowley, even engaging in sex magic orgies at his Pasadena mansion. But such topics are meant for other episodes. But it was Parsons' testimony that helped pound the final nail into Kinnett's coffin. Captain Kinnett and Lieutenant Allen were convicted of attempted murder, intent to commit murder, and malicious use of explosives. Shaw would soon be removed from power after a special election won by Judge Boron. 
Two-Gun Davis would be replaced by Clemens Horrell in 1939. Now that we know just how corrupt the institutions of Los Angeles were less than a decade before Beth Short's murder, we can only wonder how many police officers who bought their badges through Joe Shaw's schemes were still on the force during the Black Dahlia investigation. And how many corrupt officials still had their jobs at City Hall. Some researchers, most notably Steve Hodell, attempt to add the Black Dahlia to a long list of unsolved murders. These murders were sometimes called the werewolf murders due to the savage, brutal violence done to the victims. But this theory was already old when John Gilmore tried to tie Beth Short and Georgette Bauerdorf together as being co-workers at the Hollywood Canteen and were both victims of Jack Anderson Wilson. I'll discuss the Hollywood Canteen later. Some suspected the Black Dahlia murder was connected to other murders almost the same time as Beth's body was found. Aggie Underwood wrote in the Los Angeles Herald Express, January 23, 1947. Werewolves leave trail of women murders in L.A. In the gory album of unsolved murders, kidnappings and crimes against women in general, Los Angeles police may have to insert a new page, the mystery of the sadistic slaying of Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia. So far all clues have failed. This latest murder mystery, which has provoked the greatest mobilization of crime detection experts in the city's history, is the latest in a long series. The finding of her dismembered body was preceded by other gruesome discoveries of women victims slain for lust, for revenge, for reasons unknown. Along with being called the werewolf murders, the victims are also referred to as the lone woman murders. Let's take a look at the list. Note, this list may have more or fewer names than others due to researchers adding to it or omitting some due to their personal theories. A thorough study of these murders would require separate episodes. Except for the more documented cases, I will give the basic details of the victims and crime scenes, leaving it up to you, the viewer, to research any cases in detail and determine any connection to the Black Dahlia. See links below for more information on the victims. Ora Murray, age 42, the White Gardenia murder, murdered July 27, 1943. Ora was in Los Angeles visiting her sister. Ora was married, and her husband, an army sergeant, was stationed in Mississippi. After a night of dancing at the Zenda Ballroom with her sister, Latona Lanin, Ora and her sister accepted a ride from a man named Paul who they had met at the club and danced with. After dropping her sister at home, Ora left with Paul, who had offered to give her a tour of Hollywood. Ora was found dead the following morning on the grounds of Fox Hill Golf Course. She had been severely beaten and strangled. Georgette Bauerdorf, age 20, murdered October 12, 1944. Of these murders, Georgette is one of the most documented and usually tied in with Beth Short, although erroneously. Georgette was a socialite from New York, born to parents George Frederick Bauerdorf and Constance. Her mother died in 1935. She had an older sister named Connie. Georgette had been raised in the wealth and privilege of a well-to-do family that traveled frequently, including trips to Europe when Georgette was a girl. She also benefited from the best private schools, including St. Agatha's School for Girls in New York City, and when the family moved to Los Angeles after her mother's death, she attended the Marlboro School and later the Westlake School for Girls. She worked for the Los Angeles Times and later volunteered at the Hollywood Canteen as a junior hostess on Wednesday nights. Some researchers, especially John Gilmore in his book Severed, say that Beth Short also worked at the Hollywood Canteen at the same time as Georgette. But the official timeline of Beth's known movements does not have her in the area at the time. To further prove that Beth did not work at the Hollywood Canteen, all girls working at the canteen were thoroughly screened, fingerprinted by the FBI, and given a photo ID before being accepted as volunteers. Any proof that Beth had worked at the Hollywood Canteen would have been found when the sound photocopies of her fingerprints were sent to the FBI. Her history at the canteen would have been found alongside her arrest record and her documents of employment at Camp Cook. So the Beth being a junior hostess alongside Georgette Bauerdorf is just another Dahlia myth. 
Georgette was planning a trip to Texas to visit her boyfriend, Jerry Brown, stationed at Fort Bliss. On the afternoon of October 11 she cashed a check for $175 and bought a plane ticket. A co-worker at both the Los Angeles Times and the Hollywood Canteen, June Ziegler, noticed Georgette sitting in her car, knitting, before the start of her shift. Ziegler said Georgette seemed nervous and asked her to spend the night at her place. However, Georgette gave no reason for either her nervousness or the reason she wanted company that night. Later during her shift at the canteen, there were reports that Georgette had a persistent patron who kept cutting in on her dances, insisting on jitterbugging, a dance style Georgette did no like, but she relented in an effort to get him to leave her alone. Georgette left the canteen at around 11.30. She picked up a hitchhiker, a one Sergeant Gordon Oddland, on her way home. She dropped him off, and he estimated that he spent 10 to 15 minutes with her. After seeing Georgette's picture in the paper the following day, he sent a letter to the police detailing his time with Georgette. He was not then or ever was a suspect, but he was most likely the last person besides her murderer to have seen her alive. She arrived home at her home in the El Palacio apartments around midnight. At about 2.30 a.m. a neighbor heard screams coming from Georgette's apartment followed by her yelling, Stop, you're killing me. This good neighbor went back to bed and later claimed that he thought it had just been a family argument. On the morning of October 12, 1944, a cleaning crew consisting of El Palacio Apartments janitor Frederick Atwood, his wife, Lulu, and a daughter, upon arriving to clean Georgette's apartment found the door open. Entering, they heard water running in the bathroom. They found Georgette submerged in the overflowing bathtub. Georgette had been raped. Death was due to strangulation from what was first called a washcloth, but later identified as a rolled medical bandage that had been shoved down her throat. Her bruised and battered body showed that she had not just taken a beating but put up a hell of a fight against her attacker. There was evidence that her murderer had been waiting for her. The automatic light by her door had been disabled by someone partially unscrewing it. Was he lurking outside when she got home? He may have been, but he did not strike immediately. The janitor said he heard footsteps moving around in Georgette's apartment soon after midnight, and later heard a sound like a crash, as if she had dropped something. There was autopsy evidence that she had eaten string beans about an hour before her death, and an empty can of string beans was found in her garbage along with melon rinds. The killer may have been watching through her window. It was said that Georgette sometimes forget to close her curtains while she was getting ready for bed. Somehow, he had gotten into her apartment. Her car, a 1936 Oldsmobile coupe, had been stolen and later found out of gas on East 25th Street. Gertrude Evelyn Landon, age 36, disappeared July 10, body found July 15, 1946. Strangled. Her body wore expensive jewelry. Along with her wedding ring, she wore a 22-stone engagement ring and necklace. Like Georgette, her car was stolen. Her car, a 1933 Plymouth sedan was found on July 18 on the corner of Menlo Street and Slauson Avenue. Elizabeth Short, The Black Dahlia, 1947. Mary Tate, age 37, murdered January 18, 1947. Strangled. Although her husband was initially arrested, in the end the crime was never solved. Jean French, age 44, The Red Lipstick Murder, murdered February 10, 1947. Jean French is another of the more documented victims on this list. Jean was born October 6, 1902 in Texas. She married a rich oilman named David Yandel Rather, and they had a son also named David. Jean worked as a nurse. After divorcing Rather, Jean and her son moved to L.A., where she continued her work nursing and married her second husband, David Thomas. After divorcing Thomas, she joined a nursing team working for a Colombian oil company. While employed with the Colombian company, she became interested in flying. She learned to fly and became one of the famous 99s, a woman's flying group that included Amelia Earhart as the group's first president. 
the press called her the flying nurse. She married her third husband, a fellow pilot named Curtis Bauer, but the marriage lasted a mere five weeks. It was said she had some acting roles under the name, Jean Axford Thomas, but I did not find a listing on the IMDb website. In 1945 she married for the fourth and final time to Frank French. The marriage was turbulent and Jean was sometimes abusive to Frank, and during this time she started drinking. They separated in 1947 shortly before her murder. On the morning of February 10, 1947, H.C. Shelby was walking to his construction job when he saw what he thought to be women's clothes piled in the weeds in a vacant lot in an area called the Moors just off the sidewalk. Shelby lifted a fur-trimmed coat to find Jean's naked corpse underneath. She had been savagely beaten and her corpse had been defaced with words written in Jean's own red lipstick. What exactly was written is still debated. Some say it was fuck you, BD, others say it was PD, Tex was written beneath that, whether Tex was a reference to Jean being from Texas or someone's name, is debated. Jean had been beaten into unconsciousness by a blunt metal instrument that Dr. Newbar said in the autopsy report might have been a socket wrench. But her cause of death was listed as hemorrhage and shock from fractured ribs and multiple injuries caused by stomping, no doubt with feet, as heel prints were visible on the chest of the victim. Her husband, Frank, had been the first suspect, especially after they found out Jean had visited him only hours before her murder, and she continued her abusive streak by hitting him with her purse. Although Roy J. Fetcher claimed that Jean had been at the cafe he operated at around 9.30 and told him her husband was the abusive one, telling him he was sadistic and into dark things. She then showed him her two black eyes. Frank swore to her son, David, after David confronted him, that he did not kill her, and he passed a lie detector test, backing up his statement. His landlady confirmed that she had not seen Frank leave his apartment after Jean's visit before her murder. Also, shoe prints found at the scene did not match Frank's. Evelyn Winters, age 43, body found March 11, 1947. She had been beaten to death. The man who discovered her body strangely kissed her corpse. Dorothy Montgomery, age 36, the butterfly murder, murdered May 2, 1947. Her nude body was found under a pepper tree in a vacant lot on Grape Street. She had been strangled, struck on back of head causing laceration, breast slashed. Her golden butterfly was found under her corpse. Laura Trelstad, age 37, murdered May 12, 1947 in Long Beach, mother of three young children. Husband wouldn't take her dancing on Mother's Day, so she went on her own. Seen leaving bar with three sailors. Raped and strangled. Rosenda Mondragon, age 20, silk stocking murder, murdered June 21, 1947, strangled with silk stocking, body dumped in gutter probably from moving car. Lillian Dominguez, age 15, murdered October 2, 1947. Santa Monica. Lillian, her sister, and a friend were walking home from a dance when a man suddenly stabbed her in the chest with a stiletto, puncturing her heart. This case is sometimes lumped in with the others, but police officially linked it to the non-lethal stabbing of 14-year-old Barbara Jean Morse about a month earlier. See link below for more details. Gladys Kern, age 42, murdered February 14, 1948. Real estate agent murdered while showing a house at 4217 Cromwell Avenue in the Los Feliz district. Mimi Boomhor, age 48, the merry widow, body never found but declared dead 11 days after being reported missing August 1949. However, the judge changed that ruling in November returning it to the standard seven-year time period for missing persons. Although wealthy, she was having financial troubles after her husband's death and decided to sell assets. Speculation includes that she may have been trying to sell her house on her own and was murdered while showing it to a potential buyer like Gladys Kern. Louise Springer, age 35, body found June 16, 1949. Reported missing by her husband, her corpse was found about 60 hours later, 
decomposing in her car parked at 125 West 38th Street. Her husband, Lawrence Springer had picked her up at about 9 p.m. at the hair salon she operated. Lawrence went to retrieve her forgotten glasses, leaving her in the car, listening to the radio. He also took time to talk with a friend and buy a magazine and smokes. He estimated he was gone for 10 to 15 minutes. When he returned to the parking lot, both Louise and his car were gone. He notified police at about 10 p.m., but was told he must wait 24 hours to file a report. Louise had been strangled, and a 14-inch long one-half-inch thick twig had been shoved into her vagina. Like Georgette Bauerdorf and Gertrude Landon, Springer's car was stolen. The vacant lot where Beth's body was found was only about a block from the parking lot where Louise was taken. Jean Spengler, age 27, last seen October 7, 1949, Purse found October 9, 1949 in Griffith Park, body never found. Jean Spengler was an actress on the cusp of stardom by the time of her disappearance. She had already been in such films as The Miracle of the Bells, Mummy's Dummies, and When My Baby Smiles at Me, in 1948, Chicken Every Sunday, in 1949, and after her disappearance the films, Young Man with a Horn, Wabash Avenue, Champagne for Caesar, and The Petty Girl were released in 1950. Although she was uncredited in all films, she had already appeared with such notables as Frank Sinatra, Betty Grable, Victor Mature, Doris Day, Lauren Bacall, and Kirk Douglas, who would become involved in the investigation. Jean had started her career as a dancer at Earl Carroll's, and what should be a very well-known place by now, the Florentine Gardens, when she was still in her teens. A year after graduating from high school Jean married Dexter Benner. They had one child, Christine, but divorced in 1946. Jean and Dexter became embroiled in a long, bitter battle for the custody of Christine. First, Benner was given custody in 1946, and he refused visitation rights to Jean. However, Jean finally won custody of Christine in 1948. At the time of her disappearance, Jean and Christine were living with Jean's mother Florence, and her brother Edward and sister-in-law Sophie. On October 7, Jean left Christine with Sophie and went to see Benner about missing a child support payment, afterwards she said she had a night shoot for an undisclosed film. Jean later called home and told Sophie that she would have to work later on the film than anticipated, and she shouldn't expect her home till morning. When Jean didn't show up, Sophie called the police. Benner claimed to police that he never had the meeting with Jean and hadn't seen her for several days. His new wife of one month backed his story. Jean was seen at a farmer's market near her home by a saleswoman who said she appeared to be waiting for someone. Investigators found that Jean did not have a filming shoot the night of her disappearance. After finding her purse in Griffith Park, police and volunteers thoroughly searched the park, but found nothing. The purse was the only thing found of Jean, and the straps had been ripped away from the purse as if someone had yanked it from her arm. An unfinished note was found in Jean's purse addressed to Kirk, which read, Kirk, can't wait any longer, going to see Dr. Scott. It will work best this way while mother is away. Some claim Dr. Scott was part of the abortion ring mentioned in the previous episode along with Leslie C. Audrain. And some of Jean's friends claimed that Jean had told them she was pregnant and contemplating an abortion. A lead to who Kirk was came from Jean's mother, who said a man named Kirk had picked Jean up on two occasions. When it was discovered that Jean had appeared in the yet-to-be-released film, Young Man with a Horn, starring Kirk Douglas, speculation that he was the mentioned Kirk led Kirk Douglas to notify the police and release the following statement on October 12, 1949. I told Detective Chief Thad Brown that I didn't remember the girl or the name until a friend recalled it was she who worked as an extra in a scene with me in my picture, Young Man with a Horn. Then I recalled that she was a tall girl in a green dress. I talked and kidded with her a bit on the set. But I never saw her before or after that and have never been out with her. He also said he was in Palm Springs on the day of Jean's disappearance. Some think Jean left town with mobster Davy Ogle.
He was rumored to be Jean's secret boyfriend and was under indictment for conspiracy at the time he disappeared, the same day Jean's purse was found. Witnesses claimed to have seen Jean and Ogle in both Palm Springs and Las Vegas along with another missing mobster, Frank Nicoli. In 1950 Jean and Ogle were supposedly seen at an El Paso, Texas motel. And there is always the possibility that she died while getting an abortion or after due to complications. Jean's mother Florence thought Jean was dead and released this statement. I'm sure she would have communicated with us if she was alive and free. And nobody can tell me should have left her baby unless she was forced to. Make of these what you will. There are not many similarities with most of these murders. Many of the victims were drunk at the time. Most had been strangled. None had been bisected with surgical precision. The Black Dahlia murder was unique in the annals of crime. And we will look at how rare and unique in the final episode. There was some police speculation that some of the murders were connected, and press reports stated that they believed connections existed, but in the end, nothing was ever proven. The Black Dahlia was made a famous murder the moment the moniker was revealed in headlines. Press headlines including Black Dahlia in the title would have sold better than trying to create a new popular myth to replace her. And so tying these murders in with her makes sense from a business standpoint to sell more papers, even if it makes less sense from a criminal standpoint. The unsolved murders were a significant portion of the 1949 grand jury investigation as stated by jury foreman Harry Lawson. There is every possibility that we will summon before the jury officers involved in the investigation of these murders. We find it odd that there are on the books of the Los Angeles Police Department many unsolved crimes of this type. Because of the nature of these murder and sex crimes, women and children are constantly placed in jeopardy and are not safe from attack. Something is radically wrong with the present system for apprehending the guilty. The alarming increase in the number of unsolved murders and other major crimes reflects ineffectiveness in law enforcement agencies and the courts, and that should not be tolerated. But he does not state a definitive connection to the Black Dahlia murder, only seems to point to the possibility of incompetence on the part of investigating officers. Something interesting to note is that there was a club active in Hollywood called the Hollywood Wolves Association. Shown is the membership card of Chet Montgomery. In the end, it is up to each individual viewer to do their own research and come to your own conclusions. Personally, I don't see a connection with the Black Dahlia murder. Next week we will look into charges of corruption brought up in Stoker's book Thicker and Thieves and other items investigated by the grand jury including the Dillon fiasco.